Very well, then let's get started here. I have to say, it's really freaking amazing to see a real-world audience again at such an event. So, welcome to all of you, and thanks for coming to our um, NCCR symposium today on the system theory of algorithms. I uh, especially want to welcome our speakers here today, um, from left to right, the Severi Bolgnani, Lacra Pavel, Michael Mühlbach, and Tamer Bassar. I'll later introduce them when they give their respective talks. Before that, I just wanted to get everybody on board and shine a spotlight on the topic of today um, by sort of giving you two different perspectives on how you can think about algorithms. The traditional perspective is just an algorithm is a piece of code, as indicated in this picture, that is somewhat monolithic and not interface with the world. At most, you put in some parameters, some initializations, some random seeds, but otherwise just, you know, a perfect map. The viewpoint we want to take today in this symposium is the following. We want to look at iterative algorithms as they occur in learning, in optimization, and in games, and think about these algorithms as dynamical systems, typically discrete time, that interface with the world through inputs and outputs with time series data. Okay? And we also want to forepropagate uncertainty through these algorithms. So we really want to take perspective, an algorithm is a discrete time dynamical system. And just to hammer home this point, I brought you an ETH Zurich example um, that relates to Kalman, and I just heard some fun stories about Kalman today over lunch. I can share them later if you want. But to, to stick with the example, so uh, a classic example for thinking about an algorithm as a monolithic piece of code is the least square problem, the classic inverse inference problem. We just put in some initialization, some data, and you want to find the linear map relating inputs and outputs according to some loss function. Whereas well, you probably know, you can also do sequential least squares, where you update the solution with a rank one update. And that's also known as the Kalman filter in a more complicated setting. And the Kalman filter really thinks about an algorithm as a running algorithm, or continued learning, depending where you come from, um, that takes a time series as an input, that gives you an output, and that for propagates uncertainty, this case in the form of a covariance matrix about the estimates that you get. And of course, the idea is that you interconnect this algorithm with its inputs and outputs to a physical system as well as a control algorithm. I, I think I should bring you some examples when and where this perspective of thinking about an algorithm as a discrete time dynamical system is sort of key and enables you to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. It is relevant, of course, whenever you want to interconnect algorithms. So whenever you want to use inputs and outputs to either interconnect algorithms amongst each other as, say, in machine learning pipelines, so you have some data pre-processing, you do some PCA, and then you do again some conditioning data, you repeat, and so on. Or the common filter, when you interconnect the algorithm with decision-making in a physical system, or any sort of online optimization for control, such as equilibrium seeking, as you can see on the slide, um, or uh, MPC is another example thereof, or whenever you do some sort of real-time decision-making based on streaming data. Okay? And typically, the issues you face there are that you have to deal with online algorithms, so running algorithms, that you have to operate in real time, and resource-constrained environments, and, um, well, subject with streaming data. So an algorithm is not just a monolithic piece of code, a map that maps some initial seed to some output. More importantly, um, algorithms are ever more part of our daily reality. Uh, whether you like it or not, whenever you sign on onto the internet, you're always subjected to various recommendation systems that learn about your behavior and then want to display ads or sell you products, right? So that's essentially a gigantic reinforcement learning loop, and you're part of it, interacting with it, whether you like it or not. And so we should understand the feedback perspective on such algorithms. Also, it's key when you want to understand how uncertainty or disturbances, such as noise on the data, propagates through an algorithm. Okay? The common filter is one example, any sort of sampling-based method is another one. And finally, this is, I find personally very important, whenever you go from pure optimization to coupled optimization problems, say games, when you have self-interested decision makers, that are coupled in their decisions. For instance, the share common resource as an infrastructure network. And I think a good example for that is um, the current crisis in global supply chains, I would think these are a whole bunch of self-interested decision-makers that obviously were all coupled in their actions and that reached a fairly stable national equilibrium until the COVID pandemic hit it hard, right? And now we're out of equilibrium and we should understand whether this is robust or not and we get back to it or we stay in a logjam. So these are some sort of the motivations for the theme of today. And I, I want to leave some cliffhangers here, some questions that we have after today 
uh, some provocative statements, and hopefully these will be partially answered by the talks or at the latest in the panel discussion or one-on-one -on -one meetings that you have with the speakers. Uh, the first sort of bold claim is, you know, are algorithms just dynamic systems, right? Algorithms are not just a piece of code. They're discrete time dynamic systems that interact with the environment and with the world. You could take that viewpoint and say, oh, there's a hammer and there's a nail, and see what we can do with it. Um, it sort of offers an opportunity for people from different communities to come together, say machine learning, optimization, control games, as well as the application domains that care about these implementations, hopefully. And the hope is, of course, whenever you see pictures like this one, that looks very much like a feedback loop, but nobody analyzes it as a feedback loop and interconnections of these algorithms. So we'd hope that um, the tools from system theory or controls can some, bring some sort of structure and order to these types of problems, which are currently a little bit the Wild West. Now, of course, these are all a little bit provocative statements, and you may argue, is it really a hammer and a nail? Uh, does anybody care about what we're doing here, that we're sitting here and debating these topics? And, you know, can we actually bring anything to the table? Right? So, provocatively said, is this eventually the beginning of a golden age where you can use whatever half years, half, no, half year, half a decade of experience from one community and apply it to contemporary problems? Or is this just not a short-lived hype cycle? Okay. Some of the questions we'd like to explore here and today. Before we go there, um, I want to quickly call up John Ligueros on the stage because it's the NC Automation, uh, who John is heading, that is sponsoring these events, and he may want to introduce you to that. Thanks, Florian. Yeah, so let me add my welcome to that of Florian's. It's very nice to see all of you uh, uh, live uh, uh, today. Uh, and also let me add the welcome on behalf of Gabriela Hu, who is the co-director of the NCCR, who unfortunately uh, couldn't be uh, here this afternoon. Uh, I have just a couple of slides on what the NCCR is about. Uh, this is uh, sort of uh, uh, this uh, workshop is organized together with uh, NCCR Automation. Um, the NCCR is a research project plus. It's actually much bigger than your average research project. We'll see the, in a couple of slides how many people are involved. These are large projects that are funded by the Swiss uh, government on topics, basic research topics that they consider of strategic importance to the Swiss society and, uh, and uh, economy and so on. Okay? But they're not just research projects. They, they can run for up to 12 years, so they're quite long. They call them centers because they not only cover research, but they also cover other topics like education, promotion of uh, young uh, researchers, technology transfer uh, is an integral part of this. In general, they're viewed as a way to strengthen uh, the national and international uh, structures around the chosen uh, field. So a couple of years ago, the Swiss government decided to fund such a research project in the topic of automation, centered around automatic control topics, and beyond, uh, uh, also in the, in the direction of machine learning, for example, cybersecurity, and other uh, uh, topics of interest to automation. Now, the research in the NCCR is structured around both theory and method, so we cover a very broad spectrum. Uh, this is sort of the schematic uh, to, to, to show this. On the method side, there's a lot of math type uh, work on the foundations of systems uh, theory and automation, as well as computational methods, optimization, embedded optimization, cybersecurity, uh, and, and uh, topics like this. On the other hand, we have applications on, on, on your right. Uh, we, have, we covered three in the first phase of the NCCR, a big emphasis on energy systems, uh, that's also the co-director is from this area, as well as mobility and Industry 4.0. And the idea is that there's a loop uh, going on here between the methods, the fundamental developments that get uh, uh, tested in the applications, and then from this you draw motivation for developing more, you know, improving the methods, tailoring the methods, customizing the methods, and taking the next step. And hopefully through this loop, both the methods and the applications uh, benefit. Now, you can tell already this is quite an interdisciplinary uh, topic with uh, people more on the mathematics, optimization, automatic control side on one side, computational methods, and then people from the applications. And we brought together a fairly large team to do this. There are 19 principal investigators. You see their pictures here. The split between four campuses, the majority at ETH Zurich, 
uh, including myself and uh, Gabriela Hook, the co-director. Uh, we've split, divided into several departments, mechanical engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, uh, as well as uh, uh, civil engineering. And then there's from EPFL in uh, uh, mathematics operations research, transportation, and uh, uh, automatic control. At EMPA, this is a, a research lab over the, the hill in Dübendorf, uh, and Fagoschul in North West Schweiz. And then in addition to that, we have uh, researchers. There's about 50 plus at any point in time, PhD students and postdocs that are working with us, as well as seven affiliated members that joined us on, from other institutions as well, and on topics also having to do with the social sciences and, for example, application of game theory to social or economic uh, problems. It's not just research, and uh, for this we need support also from a management team. I have their pictures here, uh, and uh, some of them, for example, in the center is Elise, who's holding the whole uh, uh, project together, and you've interacted with her, uh, I'm sure, most of you on, on different occasions. Uh, we have two people who are uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, communication topics, Ariane Bastani and Linda Seward, and uh, Sylvia is looking after equal opportunities. Uh, ben Saviki, Technology Transfer, and then we have two scientific officers, uh, uh, Vahid Mamdouhi and uh, Frederick Banis. And together with members of the uh, 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 consortium, they look after all of these topics that have to do with not necessarily research, but still equally important. Uh, uh, so we have teams that are looking after our research strategy, communication and outreach, equal opportunities, technology transfer and education. And you see the people here, most of them you know from you know, Silvia, Nicolas, uh, Giancarlo and Florian, uh, Colin are the PIs, and then they're supported by the management team people. So that in a nutshell is the activity that's going on. It will keep us busy hopefully for the next 10 years. Uh, so if you get the chance to come back in that interval, you may hear more about how we're doing on this. This is only our second year now, but we've already started with a bang, and we have brought in a, a large number of researchers despite the pandemic, uh, and uh, uh, many of them are here in the audience today, so I'm looking forward to vibrant discussions, both uh, uh, during the meeting and then at the upper afterwards. So with this, I think I'll hand back to Florian, who will take you through the program for the day. Very good, and I'll promise to keep it short because you're not here to listen to me, of course. Uh, very quickly, why did we settle on this program, on this format? Uh, the pragmatic reason we were all just really bored of online seminar series. And so we thought, let's create another type of event, like the symposium, um, that is just more attractive to both the audience and the speakers, and also more visible, and might hopefully work well in a virtual format. Yeah, so hello to the online audience out there who are hopefully listening. You can also ask questions if you type in the chat. Um, another reason is community building, right? Bringing together people from across the country in the NCCR. We don't see each other that often and from elsewhere. Can I do a quick poll in the audience? Who would affiliate herself, himself with control? Optimization? Machine learning? Games? Who raised his hand more than well, four times? All right, at least one person. <laughs> Great. So uh, hopefully afterwards we're all a little more expert in everything. Um, it also has an educational aspect. So the researchers of the NCCR, or part of them, have prepared for this event with uh, a reading group where they were dissecting the speakers' papers and now all the strengths and weaknesses about them. And that should hopefully make for fun interactive discussions. <coughs> Quick acknowledgments to some um, um, invisible heroes, but they were organizing the show. On the one hand, there's uh, the entire event management team surrounding Sabrina, Elise, and Minky. Thank you very much for putting this together. Quick round of applause. <laughs> Great. There are, of course, the reading groups that have been dissecting the papers. Uh, thank you all. And they prepared some fierce interrogation for afterwards. And then there's uh, Niao, who's also co-organizing the event, and Giuseppe and Dominic, who were running the reading groups and who will be chairing uh, what comes next. So also thank you. <laughs> as well as many of our staff from the NCCR and the Automatic Control Lab. Good. Um, last slide, quickly on logistics. Now we'll have two talks, uh, about 40 minutes each, plus five minutes of question by Tamer Bassar and Michael Mühlbach. 
Then we'll have a coffee break, I think, right out there, so you don't have to go far. There's also restrooms there. Everything's nearby. Another two talks by Lacro Pavel and Saveri Bolgnani. And afterwards, we have the panel discussion that's now set up for about 45 minutes, but this can be shorter or longer. And I would envision some sort of continuous transition to the upper row, which is also served right out there. Very good. And then I'll conclude here, and I'll let either of you guys take over. <laughs>